Thanks to Brilliant for supporting this SciShow video. As a SciShow viewer, you can keep building your STEM skills with a 30-day free trial and 20% off an annual premium subscription at brilliant.org slash SciShow. You'd be forgiven for assuming that the Arctic and the Antarctic are pretty similar, ecologically speaking. After all, how different can one frozen wasteland be from another, really? But as much as we might think of both places as similar, icy cold environments, there are major differences aside from the obvious one of just how far apart they are from each other. Given the massive distance between the Arctic and the Antarctic, you wouldn't think there'd be a ton of species that live in both places. But shockingly, there are some species that do just that. Being members of the same species means that populations need to be able to mate and have gene flow between them. But when it comes to these species, we're still trying to figure out just how they manage to swap genes with individuals at the opposite ends of the Earth. The Arctic and the Antarctic regions are 12,000 kilometers apart at their closest point. Not only are they far apart, the environments between these poles are extremely different, namely warmer. So it's hard to imagine a species so globally widespread that it would survive basically everywhere from each frosty pole to the warm waters in between. Species found at both polar regions are called bipolar in the geographical sense. A species is bipolar if it has populations higher than the latitude of 55 degrees north or lower than 52 degrees south. But that doesn't necessarily mean all bipolar species are only found at these extremes. Take whales. Blue whales, fin whales, and humpback whales are found at both poles, but they hang out in the warmer waters between the poles too. Which means we know how they get to either pole. They just swim there. While these whale migration distances are obviously impressive, the bigger mystery is how teeny little creatures like algae, tube worms, crustaceans, and bacteria have ended up in two very distant places especially when they don't seem to hang out anywhere in between. The idea of species living at both poles got a lot of buzz when a survey of marine life published in 2009 revealed that at least 235 species were found living in both places. Now, that doesn't mean the species referenced in the study were exclusive to the poles. It's also possible that some of the specimens grouped into one species by this study may actually be multiple species that just you know, look-alike? Since then, genetic analysis has revealed that a number of these allegedly bipolar species should actually be split into separate species across the poles. But other analyses found that some living things like microbes living in both the Arctic and Antarctic are shockingly similar. Gene sequencing revealed that these polar populations were actually more closely related to each other than they were to microbes living much closer to them geographically. For example, in 2015, researchers studied three bipolar species of ciliates, a kind of single-celled microorganism. The researchers determined that two out of those three ciliates were different enough between polar populations to be considered separate species. However, they also found that one of the ciliate species could still breed with individuals from the other pole, even if they were genetically distinct. And an earlier study from 2007 also found that multiple species of deep-sea foraminifera, a different type of single-celled organism, were genetically very similar to each other at both of the poles. There are two possible explanations for this. One is that the foraminifera could just be really common all over the world and live in most of the regions between the poles too, but we just haven't found them there yet. The other possibility is that even if these species aren't crossbreeding anymore, they may be evolving so slowly that they're still basically the same genetic species today. So despite being separated for huge stretches of time, not to mention the thousands of kilometers of distance, they maintain roughly the same genetic makeup they've had for eons. But conservation of genes isn't the only explanation for bipolar species, since there are a few populations still swapping genes from opposite poles to this day. Take Eurythines gorillus, a kind of amphipod that was once thought to be one contiguous species, found in basically any ocean water deep enough to support it. But a study in 2013 split the species into nine different lineages, that all vary by region. The weird thing was, 
The samples of this amphipod from both poles showed very little genetic divergence, despite the genetic diversity in populations between the poles. That tells us there's likely still gene flow going on between these two distant populations. Which means the real puzzle is how they even get from one location to the other. It's possible these amphipods, and a host of other critters, are traveling along an underwater current called the Antarctic Bottom Water, which begins in the Weddell Sea off the northern coast of Antarctica and continues along the ocean floor. Of course, not all bipolar species are up for surfing the deep sea, like those that don't live there to begin with. Those guys might actually be hitchhiking their way from pole to pole. 23 plant species that have been identified across the northern hemisphere also grow along the very southernmost tip of South America. For these plants, there are two proposed ways they're getting from A to B. On one hand, there's a mountain hopping hypothesis, which predicts these species migrate between different suitable mountain habitats, eventually making their way down the Rockies and Andes. But only six of the 23 bipolar plant species have been found in any intermediate locations between the poles. So if the other 17 species are leapfrogging, they're playing hide and seek at the same time. So that leaves us with another hypothesis. Maybe the plants are being spread directly from one pole to the other. Long distance dispersal seems like a literal long shot, but it could happen a number of ways. Their seeds could be carried by wind, water, or even animals, either by attaching to their ride's body or being eaten and later pooped out. But since the distance is so massive between these poles, for animals to be carrying the seeds from one pole to the other would mean the trip would need to be very direct and very fast so as not to lose their um, parcel too soon. Enter the long distance shorebirds. In a study from 2022, researchers wanted to identify potential candidates for dispersing these plants by looking for birds capable of long distance flight whose ranges overlapped with where the bipolar plants were found. They identified that birds called Hudsonian godwits overlap the most with the ranges of the bipolar plant species, followed by the Eskimo curlew. And while their longest continual flights are off the charts, an incredible 10,000 kilometers without stopping, that still isn't enough distance to make up the trip from one pole to the other all in one go. So there might be more than one species involved in getting plants from one pole to the other after all, instead of a single long distance delivery. Tragically, the Eskimo curlew, which was once one of the most common shorebirds in North America, is now likely extinct thanks to extreme overhunting and habitat destruction on our part. So even if they were once the distributors of bipolar plants, they aren't anymore. Regardless of how they're getting there, these surprisingly bipolar species are not only showing us the need for further studies, but also helping to sound an alarm for these fragile frozen environments. For one, Climate change appears to be slowing the formation of deep water currents, like the Antarctic bottom water, which could have huge implications for the global distribution of deep sea organisms. But we've really only been exploring deep sea life at a molecular level since the 1980s, so we still have a lot to learn. So when it comes to how these polar populations pull off their long distance sharing of their gene pools, it looks like we're left with more questions than answers at least for now. This SciShow video is supported by Brilliant, the interactive online learning platform with thousands of lessons to choose from in math, science, and computer science. You math heads out there might be drawn to the Brilliant course on number bases, but this course has something for everyone, whether you think you're into math or not. See, the only reason you were able to watch this video is because of number bases. And that's because computing systems use binary, which is a number base of two, to do everything they do. This brilliant course will walk you through the idea more thoroughly, but the gist is that the number base of two of binary means that there are only two digits to work with. For computers, it's zero and one. And all of those zeros and ones come together to let me teach you about zeros and ones. So anyone who likes to use computers, say for watching SciShow videos, can learn more about how they work at brilliant.org slash scishow. That search will start you off with a free 30-day trial and 20% off an annual premium Brilliant subscription. Thanks for watching and thanks to Brilliant for supporting this video. 